Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for registering. My name is Hans van den Hurk. Uh, with us is Philip Baker and the state Hyperexe. We are going to present today to you the cases uh, to Starbucks and Fiat. And we will do that by first giving an introduction to the environment, the legal environment of, of state aid in, in a few slides. Then we will follow up with a uh, depressive pricing analysis, as, as you might have seen. The, uh, in both cases, um, transfer pricing is, is one of the reasons why we have sometimes more than 500 considerations in the case. So, Steve Huybrechts will take care of that. Uh, followed up by, by, by Philip Baker, who then is going to discuss the, the analysis of the European Commission uh, in the illegal context, tax-wise context, of course. I will follow up with um, the Belgium coordination center case and the differences between integrated companies versus single entity companies. And we have the last couple of slides on, on pending cases, and which we are not going to discuss in all detail, but just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's going on. And of course, afterwards, if you have questions, you can uh, put them in the box in your screen, and uh, we will answer them as soon as, as good as we can afterwards. So let's start with the first slide. One later, please. Yes, this is Miss Vester, as her name is being pronounced in Danish. She is the European Commissioner on Competition, of which state aid is one of the uh, sectors. Um, and this quote is hers from last year, where she says, we are doing this because people are angry. And as you know, as a European commissioner, you should test whether, for example, the state aid rules are being applied in the correct way by the states of the European Union. And that's probably the only test she has to fulfill, and much less the quote, which indicates that she also has a political role. It's undeniable that Texas nowadays uh, influenced by political reasoning, but nevertheless, uh, yeah, you see the same thing to a certain extent also in the state aid discussions. That's why I put this quote first. So the basis of state aid, and Philip Baker is going to address that in much more detail later, is actually four or five steps. We always you start with there should be a benefit. And, and then you'll find four criteria of which actually two, four, and five are often being accepted by the European Court of Justice and General Court as being fulfilled. So if it's about tax, it's of course clear if you give taxes away that it's paid by state resources. And if you give a benefit which not all the companies get, then the company is in principle distorted. So that's the fourth one. And as a consequence, there can arise a potential effect uh, on trade between member states. So, more or less, these criteria are always being accepted. The main issue is always the selectivity. Does the intervention give the recipient an advantage on a selective basis? And um, I'm not going to say too much about the case because and Steve and Philip are going to do that. Um, but it's clear that the selectivity criterion is here the main reason uh, why this has been such a difficult case. Because it's all about the question whether Luxembourg and or the Netherlands have provided a benefit to a company which not all companies could get. That brings me to a few lines on the next slide in the sorts of state aid we have. And, and yeah, there are, of course, more existing aid is, of course, also something I could explain. But you will read in all state aid cases, in all discussions about illegal state aid and unlawful state aid. Illegal state aid is aid which has not been notified, and which is selective. Uh, and as a consequence, it should be challenged and should be paid back with interest 
from the start of the moment that the aid has been provided. Unlawful state aid is a reasoning, is a, a, a facility, a benefit provided which hasn't been notified to the European Commission. And you will read and see in the current cases we're going to discuss that in both cases, um, neither Luxembourg nor the Netherlands did notify uh, the benefit, if there is any benefit, to the European Commission simply because they suggested they don't see that benefit. And they are much more in line like this is a regular application of a domestic tax rules and therefore there's no reason to notify anything. So my next slide is on state aid and tax rulings. Again, also Philip will discuss it. Um, there are always differences between APR and APA in an advanced tax ruling. Normally you interpret the domestic law and, and, and in such a ruling, it's more like a statement on the current affairs of the law and, and not like we discuss some pricing, which is, of course, in an advanced pricing agreement, much more the case. Um, and therefore, in an advanced pricing agreement, in a ruling um, on that perspective, yeah, it's always about did my comparable competitor get the same treatment and in order to be comparable you have to dive into all the elements of the case all the facts of the situation and that's what in this case will be addressed with by Steve later on but keep in mind that selectivity has some actually several identities it's it's a different treatment but can also be a legal uh, selective treatment it can also be a factual selective treatment, as we know from the Gibraltar case of the European Court of Justice. And, and just as an example to understand what selectivity means and, and how you can look at these cases, I always compare the Dutch informal capital rulings uh, with the Belgium access profit rulings, because in the informal capital rulings, they are based on Dutch Supreme Court uh, decisions and they are applicable in any multinational but also in any, in any single entity corporation where the shareholder acts in a not arm's length way with its BV for example and therefore there's no selectivity in principle and therefore it shouldn't be uh, recognized as state aid. In the Belgium Access Profits rulings, for example, a case which the European Court of, of the, the uh, European Commission more or less lost is the first step. Uh, it was all about having the possibility to discuss with the tax authorities the tax rate, provided that the organization is, works in at least three countries, and that condition makes it selective, and as a consequence, you are in the state aid business. Well, let's move on to the Starbucks structure, and I give the floor to Steve to discuss transfer pricing issues. Thank you, Hans. Uh, welcome, all of you. Um, just uh, a short refreshment on this slide, uh, the Starbucks case as visualized by the European Commission. Um, the the uh, actor in this uh, case is uh, Starbucks uh, Manufacturing, uh, EMEA BV, as MBV. Um, who uh, entered into a ruling with the Dutch tax authorities. Uh, what, what does this company do? It buys green beans from Switzerland. It converts them into brown beans, sells them to uh, Starbucks uh, coffee shops, as, as this picture visualizes. Um, it, it's also, uh, while doing that, um, paying a fee for the green beans to its group company in Switzerland, and it's paying a royalty to uh, what you see on the top, Alki UK, which is a UK partnership. So that's how simple the case looks like on a, on a picture like this. <clears throat> Let's now look at the next slide where I'm comparing the way I would look at it from a transfer pricing uh, perspective, uh, arm's length principle OECD. And, and then compare it with a few of the considerations by the European Commission. So if I look at as MBV acting as a polling 
um, a contractor uh, performing a conversion service from um, uh, uh, generating green beans and roasting them and, and uh, spitting out uh, brown beans. That's sort of the essence on the functions, risks, and assets. In doing that, the, um, the, the entity runs limited risk, although you can argue that there was still some inventory on the balance sheet of this BF, so there were a few risks uh, left in, into, into the financial reporting. In a typical transfer pricing case, you would classify the activities of SMBV as a cost center and therefore the uh, compensation, uh, in this case the choice of method would be a TNMM, transactional net margin method, uh, as a compensation for a relatively risk stripped operation this BV is. Uh, that leads to a very simple uh, uh, conclusion that this entity can be compensated um, on a markup on total cost, and total cost includes uh, goods of uh, cost of goods sold as well as uh, operating expenses, and on top of that, a margin. Uh, so that's the simple uh, analysis using the OECD guidelines on on transfer pricing. So what does what does the Commission tell us in 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 its attack where it says, well, this APA doesn't seem to leave sufficient profits in the books of BV. They first define uh, what, what is the reference system against which we compare this APA. That's the Dutch corporate income tax system. And secondly, they say, and, and that's the paragraph 263, uh, that in lowering BV's liability under the general uh, Dutch corporate income uh, system, we look at this BV as a non-integrated company, as a separate entity with a full autonomy. As a consequence, we apply the general principle of equal treatment in taxation as defined uh, within the application of Article 107. That means, and that's sort of the following paragraphs, that we're not looking at the Article 9 OECD model, we're not looking at Article 8B of the Dutch Corporate Income Tax Act. Um, that's that's the starting point. So they, they frame what their point of reference is, and then they start applying that frame of reference on the facts, uh, which leads in paragraph 381 to the conclusions by the European Commission that uh, as MBV is incorrectly labeled as a low risk manufacturer, uh, one reason is that the revenues uh, demonstrate that roasting is not the main source of income uh, because uh, BV derives a lot of its profits from an activity different from roasting. And basically, they see the buying of green beans and the selling of brown beans as a reselling function, which is paragraph 383, uh, and that uh, is, is representing, as they call it, the only source of BV's profits in 2010. Uh, therefore, and in addition to that, I should say, the uh, BV's accounting uh, uh, profits are also hit by a royalty being paid to this Alki entity, um, and that is further eroding uh, the profits of, uh, of this entity. Well, if, if you see the approach I've taken, a simple transfer pricing approach, I've been looking at the functionality of the roasting company. I've been looking at what the roasting company is really doing, what choice of method leaves what appropriate profit in the books of BV. Well, that profit is left in the books of the BV. What is the European, Uni uh, the European Commission doing? is taking a different set of principles. It says you need to look at the BV as an autonomous actor doing everything themselves. And in that light, uh, maybe the payment of, um, of, of the price for green beans and the, the uh, payment of the licensing fee, the royalty to Alki BV, uh, do create a leakage of profit. Uh, which um, uh, means the reported profit under the APA is an understatement of the 
a non-integrated entity profits they should have reported. Um, as, as we know, the verdict was that uh, the, the, the court decided that the approach taken uh, on the left side of this uh, of this screen was followed by the by the court, and and I think for the for the right reasons. Uh, the approach to the left is more a margin approach. The approach to the right, next to being based on a different ref set of references is taking a transactional approach. So it looks at separate transactions and says those transactions were not at arm's length. That's in a few minutes the Starbucks case. Um, let's now move on to the, the fiat case. The fiat case is basically a, a finance entity established in, uh, in Luxembourg where uh, that entity uh, was funded by equity and loan positions on the on the liability side of its balance sheet and it um, it was on lending um, uh, money to uh, fiat uh, car companies who were using it to sell cars with a financial or operational lease um, that that was the situation here um, where if we now turn to the next page Again, the same analysis follows, being a function assets and risks, and I come to the conclusion that this uh, entity in Luxembourg, this uh, fiat finance uh, group company, is a cash pool leader for the UK and provides treasury services and financing to these uh, fiat car group companies. Uh, choice of methods. Uh, here I assume that the, the money uh, landed to this entity in the month the money on land by this entity was a relatively back-to-back -back situation if i assume that i can uh, apply a tnmm so i can say i have a transactional net margin method uh, so the, uh, the the approach i would take which is then the level of in the company compensation i would um, make sure that on that instruments in there would be a spread uh, for the loans uh, forwarded to these fiat group companies and I would be left with an adequate return on the equity instruments in, in the balance sheet and that would be a normal uh, approach. Uh, here the case is a little bit uh, different because the transfer pricing report suggests that uh, the fiat finance company should not receive a return on the on its full equity because an assumption is built in in the transfer pricing report that the fiat finance company is only um, is runs only an, an uh, a risk on its on a portion of its equity. So what the transfer pricing report is doing it's taking a spread margin. It's taking a return only on a portion of the equity of that entity. Whereas in reality, uh, there was no uh, evidence uh, shown or, or uh, handed over which said there was a limited recourse on, on one of these positions. And, and in other words, uh, if uh, the fiat finance entity had to write off its full uh, depth side of the balance sheet, uh, because the, the, there was no collectible receivables left, and then it would still eat up its whole equity. That meant the facto that its whole equity was at risk. Well, that's that's sort of the the transfer pricing analysis with a few underlying assumptions on the transfer pricing report. So let's now move to the right side of uh, of uh, of the the slide. Um, here, the court endorsed the arm's length principle, again, based on Article 107. Um, here it says that is independent, uh, independently of whether a member state has incorporated the arm's length principle in its, into its national legal system. So that is not a necessity, uh, according to the court. And then uh, subsequently, based on that, uh, on those principles and those principles being applied again on the facts, as I just explained, uh, the European Commission said the 
contested tax ruling departs from the market-based outcome in line with the arm's length principle, their reference of an arm's length principle, uh, and it should be compared to a non-integrated company which transacts on market terms. So again, they say the fiat finance entity in Luxembourg is full autonomy with a full autonomy would have taken on positions and would be at risk for its whole equity and therefore it would have claimed a higher compensation than it actually did under the APA close with the Luxembourg authorities. And, and then uh, paragraph 292 concludes that, that the whole thing therefore does not result in a reliable approximation of a market-based outcome. Um, Court decided in favor of the EU Commission, uh, I think uh, probably based on the on the right reasons. Again, the two slides or the two cases I've dealt with are purely dealt with from my arm's length principle OECD concept, knowing that the European Commission took slightly deviating uh, position on the on the um, the, the set of references they used to conclude on their position. So with that, I, I think I can hand over uh, to a little bit of background on the state aid and Europe, European Commission approach to, uh, to Philip. So uh, Philip, uh, can I invite you for the next slide? Yep, with great as a pleasure. Uh, and I'm going to step back a little bit and um, talk perhaps in fairly general terms quite briefly about um, the background to the European Commission's um, approach here. I, I should emphasize I am speaking entirely in a personal capacity and I'm only going to make comments with regards to the general court's decisions in Fiat and Starbucks and I'm going to say nothing about any of the other cases, specifically nothing um, about either Apple or the UK CFC um, case there. Um, if you step back at the moment, um, everything started here um, in 2013-2014 when the Commission began its current round of examining rulings that had been given um, to particular multinational companies, um, and um, many of them were um, APAs, many of them were transfer pricing rulings, and the Commission was concerned that um, rather than um, specific regimes for multinationals, which they had challenged um, in the early 2000s, um, that uh, countries were now giving benefits to multinationals through the rulings. And the Commission started examining these rulings. Um, and to, to, to show a certain amount of sympathy to the Commission, um, they did have the, uh, a number of difficulties um, in challenging these rulings. Uh, first of all, as one would expect, uh, the rulings basically conformed with national law um, and with the OECD guidelines. Um, very often the rulings were supported by um, transfer pricing reports based on the guidelines. So if the Commission was going to challenge the rulings, they had to find some sort of higher law, if you like, or higher principle, higher than national law uh, and the OECD guidelines. That's very difficult because in principle in state aid, you're looking to see whether under national law, one um, company or one type of company is given an advantage um, by comparison with another um, comparable type of company. So they had that problem. They also had the problem that in some cases, not every country had the arm's length principle as part of its national law. So if you had a ruling that identified the profit that would be taxable in that country, um, you couldn't challenge it by saying, oh, well, uh, that's contrary to the um, national law or OECD guidelines, because they weren't part of the national law. So the, the, they had to come up with a, a sort of higher principle. Um, and um, uh, this principle, I think you can refer to, if you like, as Commission ALP. Um, Commission's um, arm's length principle, which um, I, I think one can say was invented in Brussels uh, 
sometime probably around 2015 um, and during the period that the commission was coming out with these investigations. Um, there, if you try to find um, earlier evidence of the existence of this principle, um, you won't find it, for example, in the discussions of the European Joint Transfer Pricing Forum or anywhere like that. Um, it's not as if anyone prior to, say, 2015 said, oh, by the way, under state aid law, there might be a different arms length principle different from the one that you're discussing, different from the OECD Article 9 um, based principle. There is a suggestion um, that you can find um, the basis for this um, in one sentence in the forum 187 judgment of the European Court um, there, um, but uh, though the general court um, accepts that argument, um, I think it's highly debatable that uh, Forum 187 is not a valid um, basis for this approach, though I'll leave that to others to come back on the point. What the Commission says and the General Court um, accepts this point is that um, this concept of Commission ALP is a tool or a benchmark to assess whether a selective advantage has been granted to an integrated company, um, i.e. a member of a multinational group. Um, if you look, for example, at paragraphs 151 and 152 of the Starbucks decision of the General Court, the General Court says, and I quote, the arm's length principle as described by the Commission is thus a tool for making the determination in the exercise of the Commission's powers under Article 107. The Commission stated correctly that the arm's length principle was a benchmark for establishing whether an integrated company was receiving, pursuant to a tax measure determining its transfer pricing, an advantage within the meaning of Article 107. Um, and then it goes on to say it should also be stated that when the Commission uses that tool to check whether the taxable profit of an integrated undertaking corresponds to a reliable approximation of a taxable profit generated under market conditions, the Commission can identify an advantage only if the variation between the two comparables goes beyond the inaccuracies inherent in the methodology used to obtain that approximation. Uh, two points about that. First of all, this point about inaccuracies, uh, the General Court and the Commission are both accepting that um, transfer pricing is not a precise science, and it won't give you necessarily a precise answer, um, but um, does the um, outcome um, of the uh, ruling um, differ, differ beyond the usual acceptable ac inaccuracies um, by comparison with the um, comparator. The comparator um, is the standalone enterprise. That is the enterprise which always transacts on the market. Um, and the um, buzz phrase that comes from these cases is, does the ruling give you a reliable approximation of a market-based outcome? Or if you like, Rambo, um, reliable approximation of a market-based outcome. So moving on then, um, the next slide, I think, just um, gives you the background. Sorry, could you move on to the next slide, please? Um, there. Um, the next slide really contrasts, on the one hand, the transfer pricing guidelines um, with Commission uh, ALP. So on the left-hand side, we all know the transfer pricing guidelines are highly formalized. It's a highly developed system, hundreds of pages of guidance. It's no longer simply an anti-avoidance measure. It's concerned with allocating tax rights between states. And it doesn't ignore the fact that an integrated enterprise, a member of a multinational group, does have group relationships. 
So, for example, the OECD has developed principles to apply to group synergies. And, of course, its application is based on domestic law and on tax treaties. On the other hand, Commission ALP is an entirely novel invention, and quite frankly, there are no details available about it whatsoever. There are no guidelines. We are left total uncertainty other than just this general principle. It looks to compare a member of a group with a standalone enterprise, so there's no way that it can take into account group relationships. If your transfer pricing conforms with the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, it is very clear from the Commission's decisions that that does not necessarily ensure that there is no state aid. So compliance with the OECD guidelines does not necessarily protect you. It operates independently of national law, and even if the national law does not contain the arms length principle, it is supposed to have existed since the earliest treaties came into effect in 1957, and it exists, as I say, as a tool to determine if there's been a selective advantage. So finally, what would the world look like, next slide, if the general court decisions were upheld by the Court of Justice? Um, firstly, I think one asks oneself, what is meant by a tool of state aid analysis? Is it really that different from a rule of law? I mean, assuming that the Commission is going to use this as a tool and that national governments and that enterprises wish to avoid an allegation of state aid, then a tool um, or a benchmark is as much binding as a rule of law. So you ask the question, are transfer pricing reports going to need to include in the future in the European Union a section on Yes, we can confirm that the outcome is the equivalent as for a standalone enterprise. And in principle, one can see that that might be what um, follows from this. But then how do you dis dis demonstrate that the outcome is the same as for a standalone enterprise? I have no idea what the answer to that question is and how you demonstrate it. How then does the whole system deal, for example, with group synergies? And those issues that uh, the OECD has been looking at, I'm not certain that it's capable um, of dealing with that at all. Is it the end of the OECD arms length principle as we know it? No, of course it isn't. But what we are going to have to look, uh, look at in the future, if the Court of Justice upholds this, is alongside compliance with national law and the OECD style arms length principle, we will need to have a further regard to whether or not there is state aid arising from um, a, a ruling on transfer pricing. Can I now then pass the um, matter back to, I think it's Hans who's going to talk about the coordination center judgment. Thank you very much, Philip. Yes, yes, yeah, I fully support the arguments brought in by, by Philip. There's a lot of uncertainty here, and, 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 and uh, speaking about the group synergies, um, my issue, at least what I see happening with the coordination centers case, is that the conclusion drawn by the European Commission does not seem to be in line with what really was the case there. Um, in a coordination center, you could centralize typical intergroup services for a company and you were taxed on a cost plus basis from which basis you could um, yeah, deduct some specific cost items. And in the discussion with the court and actually by the, 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 the Court of Justice, it, it was more or less um, stated that multinational companies have the possibility to actually integrate services and if you're big enough you can indeed uh, relocate your services for example to a country like belgium and then you can apply a specific system but the fact what what the european commission um i would take away from this case is that 
because a multinational is able to centralize the central services, they are able to create group synergies, and that makes it, per definition, selective. And that's, of course, not the case. And um, Belgium uh, yeah, allowed the tax uh, based on the cost plus staff and financial costs were excluded. Um, yeah, and, and then the remark, the effect of the exclusion, is from the Court of Justice, from the expenditure which serves to determine the taxable income of the centers, is that the transfer prices do not resemble those which would be charged in conditions of free competition. So the Court of Justice says, fine, it's great that you were, are able as a multinational to centralize your services. That's fine. And you will have group synergies there. But the next step is that you put a benefit to that structure by giving some specific tax treatment, which is selective. So it says something about the tax treatment of the multinational and not on the fact that they uh, uh, undergo these, these, these group synergies. So then the European Commission says the court has thus accepted that a tax measure, that's the next slide, yeah, sorry, the, the tax measure which results in the group company charging transfer prices that do not reflect those which would be charged in conditions of free competition, that is prices negotiated by independent undertakings negotiating under comparable circumstances at arm's length, confers an advantage on that group company insofar as it results in a reduction of its taxable basis, and this is tax liability under the ordinary corporate income system. But is that what is going on? Is, is it not just the fact that they see a multinational based on the fact that they are able to undergo or enjoy group synergies, therefore have a different treatment and that, that makes them selective? And that's again not what the ECJ decided, to my opinion, in the, in the, in the coordination center case. On my next slide, uh, you will see the European Commission states that MEs work in many countries and that thus they are able to enjoy benefits that domestic companies cannot enjoy. Uh, and they are able, multinationals, to be more cost effective by concentrating services in a central location. And since domestic companies cannot do the same, the European Commission says the criteria of selectivity has been met. It's cats and dogs, or dogs and cats, or whatever you prefer. And what does it say about the European Commission's arm's length principle? Well, as Philip said, it cannot be something new. Um, it, is, it is that the European Commission, of course, is allowed to test whether there's a selective treatment. And where a country wouldn't have transfer pricing regulations, yeah, then the European Commission can more or less try to derive from the sources of law the European Commission has to deal with uh, to find whether there's a selective treatment. But in principle, the European Commission is allowed to test selectivity, but the European Court of Justice always, and the General Court did actually the same, more or less, because all the discussions went on the transfer pricing and the transfer pricing guidelines. TNMM, for example, was in both cases one of the main points of discussion. So, yeah, the European Commission's ALP, I think I agree with Philip that if there is one, it, 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 it would be something which I cannot believe that the European Court of Justice will accept if there will be an appeal. So I assume it's just an approach of the European Commission dealing with the OSD arms length principle, and that's what I hope. So I really hope that the remark of Philip should there be some um, uh, additional uh, remarks in an annual report of the company with respect to the European treatment would not be necessary. As said, we just don't know this. You probably know this when there will be an appeal. So, the last three slides, ladies and gentlemen, is about three other cases which I'm not going to discuss, but just I want to make a few remarks on them. And, and, and the first case is the Finnish case, which name Yutamaki, I probably pronounced totally wrong, but nevertheless, it's a Finnish case with an interest-free loan and 
pay them to uh, other group companies, or at least the interest payments are to Luxembourg and then to the finance group company. And the question is, the finance group companies in Ireland, uh, the headquarters in Luxembourg, so you have an interest fee loan from Ireland to Luxembourg, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, I'm not going to discuss the case, but here the main problem is, which country did provide the aid? Because if you have to recover, then at least there should be a country which should take care of that recovery. So is it Luxembourg, which allowed the interest to be deducted, or is it Ireland, which allowed an interest-free loan, but Ireland didn't have those days a transfer pricing system with respect to these kind of issues. So that's one of the issues which is going to make that case also a complicated one. In the next case, the NG case, uh, there you see that, that Luxembourg dealt with, let me call it, uh, something like an, an, uh, more or less an, 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 an kind of a double dip, interest deductions, um, and, and like almost an informal capital kind of situation. And here the problem is that the normative care that the European Commission is using is that Luxembourg should have applied European Frau's legacy rules in order to correct the tax treatment as being provided by Luxembourg. And this seems to be also a next phase in, trans in, in state aid discussions because, as Philip described, um, testing a European EU arms length principle is difficult. Um, but also testing, taking into account existing cases like the Danish ones and, and many others, by the way, whether uh, a structure is state aid in a situation where there could be an infringement on the European Frost Legacy doctrine is going to be quite difficult. And the last one is EU and UK CFC legislation. The, yeah, the group financing exemption in the UK seems to be a derogation from the general CFC rules, um, as you see on the, the right box. And apparently, um, the, the point is that even if it's a derogation, the matter is whether it's focusing on a specific group of companies or sometimes focusing on a specific group of activities, um, which doesn't mean that if you focus on activities that it cannot be state aid. But again, this specific case is a case which is clearly not a clear cut case um, and, and will create a lot of discussions also in in Luxembourg. Well, one one question, uh, maybe to Philip, uh, uh, how how do you define the, uh, under which circumstances is there a difference between the two arms length concepts? So the OECD arms length principle on one side and the Commission arms length principle on the other side. You mentioned Philip uh, the synergies uh, because OECD takes takes typically an integrated view. It says synergies are allocated to group companies with better bargaining power, whereas the, the Commission takes a different view and says, well, really, uh, I'm looking at the entity which concluded this APA to have its autonomous standalone bargaining power and therefore should also get a portion of those uh, synergy results allocated to it. Um, how, would, how would this work out within the EU? So to EU countries uh, transacting with each other, and how would that work out, Philip, in the situation EU versus non-EU? Is that a question you could take, uh, Philip? Um, I can have a go at it, but I think the answer is um, I don't think there is any way in which the EU approach could um, have any answer to an issue like group synergies, because let's go back. The, the basic starting point for the Commission's um, approach is a fundamentally different starting point from the one that is adopted 
for um, OECD style transfer pricing. Um, and the um, approach that is taken is a different approach. So if you start from a different starting point and you take a different approach, um, it would be really quite astonishing if you ended up with the same answer, i.e. the um, transfer pricing methodology that was agreed um, was exactly the same um, in both situations, um, even though you started from different places. The starting point of the EU is to say, is this member of a multinational group getting a selective advantage by comparison with a standalone enterprise that is transacting on the market. And if the, um, uh, the, 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 the um, ruling results in a, an advantage by comparison with a standalone enterprise, then potentially there is state aid and it would need to be justified um, within the scope of the um, nature and general principles of the tax system. And, and by the by, let me just add one particular point that comes out of the FIAC case. It doesn't come out of Starbucks because, of course, in Starbucks, the commission lost the case. But in FIAT, um, on the question of selectivity, the um, commission took more than one route, more than one argument to identify selectivity. And one of their routes was to say, well, the ruling is addressed to a specific company, Fiat Finance. Therefore, it is an individual aid measure, and therefore it is per se selective. We do not need to go through the normal three-step process of identifying a reference system and a derogation from that reference system. And the General Court accepts that, which um, of itself is a an astonishingly wide-ranging um, uh, implications because it means that each ruling is potentially per se selective. And so the only real issue is whether the ruling gives an advantage if it's deemed to be selective. But that, that that's a sort of side point. Coming back to your original question um, there, um, because the, 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 the starting point for the EU investigation is a different one. Um, and the question is whether an advantage um, beyond the usual inaccuracies of transfer pricing, as I mentioned earlier, um, is achieved. Um, I find um, it very likely that um, the um, EU um, approach, the uh, Commission ALP, will rather than generally coming to the same conclusion as the OECD approach, it will very often come to a different conclusion. Um, and that's why um, there is a real worry. I mean, these cases um, are going to end up um, in the European Court of Justice. They're not going to be left at the general court level. And the great worry is that if the Court of Justice upholds the decisions um, of the general court, um, we have a separate parallel system of state aid based arm's length principle, arm's length pricing um, within Europe, which is not going to necessarily come to the same result as you would come to if you were applying um, Article 9 and the OECD arm's length principle. Thanks, uh, Philip. Another question uh, uh, from, we have another four or five questions, so unfortunately we will not be able to take all of them. I have a question here. Uh, maybe for you, Hans, is the Commission trying to preempt application of the BAPS principles on profit allocation to already co concluded APAs? So does it want to get some retrospective impact of BAPS accomplished through this? This system. Uh, in, in in a way, it is. If 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 you look at at uh, the Finnish case with the uh, industry loan, that's something which is covered um, by amongst others the parent subsidy directive already, and of course eight that one. Um, and so they are still retroactively trying to correct. Uh, that element, yeah, in a way it is, yeah. But that's not, although that sounds strange, from the legal perspective, it's not that strange because if there is benefit being provided, which other companies do not get, 
uit België met de Dutch Systems. Het is voor mijn capital en dat is profit. Um, so if there's something being paid to benefit provider which is selective, then they should act and make sure that a recovery will take place. So it, it's in line with the legal system. So it's also it has a political dim dimension. Clearly has the political dimension, but it's in line with the with the law. Okay. Very good. Uh, um, Ian McLean asks uh, specifically to you, Philip. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on on when and how the uh, European Court of Justice will rule? I guess the question would would apply on the uh, the fiat case. Uh, sorry, the, yeah, the fiat case or the Starbucks case, both. depending on both. The, yeah, both. Um, well, uh, I don't think at the moment we know for certain um, whether the cases are going to go on appeal, but um, I think we can assume that um, uh, Fiat um, will probably appeal their decision, um, and some of the interveners in that case may also appeal. Um, equally, the commission who lost in Starbucks um, may um, appeal that decision, um, in which case, um, the, I, the the process, I think, from going to the um, general court to the court of justice is not as long as it takes to get to the general court. So I imagine we would be looking at a hearing probably towards the end of next year or early the year afterwards. Um, it will then take um, some time for the um, court of justice to come to its conclusion. So I don't think this matter is going to be resolved until um, 2021, maybe 2022. Um, and of course, there are other pay cases in the pipeline which have their own um, uh, particular nuances. Um, if um, this idea of a, um, a commission ALP is maintained, as I've emphasized, at the moment, it has a sort of general statement, but no content. And we are going to need to see something like um, an EU version um, of the um, OECD transfer pricing guidelines, um, which um, take those parts of the guidelines that can be regarded as compatible with um, state aid law um, and uh, um, removes those parts that are perhaps incompatible. And as I keep on coming back to the same example, the, 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 the one thing that I think so nicely illustrates um, how EU transfer pricing, um, the Commission ALP, would be taking us back um, a couple of decades is this question of group synergies. And I cannot see how a standalone entity can be used as a test for determining whether um, a multinational group has correctly allocated the profits arising from group synergies. Exactly. Philip, one question from my side to you. The general court in the Starbucks case um, said that the European Commission did not harmonize uh, the rules because it, it was more or less stated that it was an informal way of harmonizing uh, European tax law by creating the European ALP. In a way, it's strange that that's that because if, if I'm listening to you and, and I agree, the rest, the rest, the rest, uh, it, 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 these are two different systems. One we know, there's pricing guidelines, the second one we don't know anything about. Um, but still, the general court rejected the position that it was a harmonization uh, act. What do you think? Well, I guess that follows from the fact that it's um, uh, said to be a tool for state aid determination um, there. But, uh, and so as a tool, it in a sense doesn't require um, countries um, to do anything. But of course, countries will not wish to be challenged for granting state aid. And so they will want to make certain that they are um, the right side of the operation of that tool. So um, I would be tempted to say that this is an attempt to harmonize an approach to um, the taxation of multinational groups um, yeah. through the back door. Um, incidentally, a small point, um, it has been suggested that um, if um, Commission ALP, the, AL, the, the, the arms principle, 
um, is um, derived from Article 107 of the treaty, then the Common Consolidated um, Corporate Tax Base, CCCTB, um, is unlawful because um, it um, is not based upon the arms length principle. And if the arms length principle is a principle of EU law, um, then um, the CCCTB um, cannot be lawful as well. Part of the answer to that is that the Commission derives the arms length principle from the um, approach um, of um, the separate entity taxation, that um, countries that tax each separate company as a separate entity must ensure that the profits of that entity um, reflect the same as the profits of a standalone enterprise. If, of course, you have a country that taxes a group on a consolidated basis, then as we all know, within the group, the arms length principle has no application. So CCCTB is in principle um, still permissible. And what one might ask, actually, is whether this isn't a, 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 um, a, an, an uh, an indirect way of pushing the European Union in the direction of CCCTB, um, at least um, internally within the Union. Okay, I think that more or less closes uh, the, the, the section. There's one comment I want to make, uh, which is uh, someone asked, uh, should we, next to concluding an APA, also get a sign-off on no state aid by the Commission if we file for an APA request? Uh, I thought that was a sort of an interesting question, but we are running out of time. Hans, maybe a few final words for before we. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are many questions to be answered. Um, that's clear. And we have many new cases coming up, uh, all cases still in the pipeline. So let's wait and see. I, I would just wanted to say to everybody, uh, specifically to Philip, thank you for your contribution, Philip. Um, from the Amsterdam office, um, thank you for uh, registering and attending this uh, webcast of the GTC Global, Global Tax Diplomacy Team. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, have you in for a next webcast whenever uh, new developments will come up. Have a nice day to you.